Hello and welcome to today's session. So this week we are trying to look at the American theater in its historical context, the socio-political as well as the cultural context from which the theater emerged from the Second World War onwards. So in the last session we briefly took a look at how we can map the emergence of American theater and the major events in the post-war society uh, against the major milestones which happened uh, not just within America, but also, you know, in the, uh, the, the <laughs> elsewhere in the world. So in this essay that we are looking at today, Arnold Aronson's American Theatre in Context, 1945 to present, this is also part of uh, the Cambridge History of American Theatre. So here we would notice that it largely talks about the tradition of performance, but it's equally important for us given that most of the plays that, you are, that we are reading as part of this uh, uh, course, they were also performed, you know, mostly in uh, Broadway. And it's important to read this as a site which reflects the ethos of the nation. So as we have stated from the outset of this course, it's very important to understand this uh, uh, genre, the theatre, these different performances as reflections of the nation's uh, uh, ideals, the, the mythology that this nation began to uh, perpetuate perhaps, you know, uh, rather later compared to historically later compared to uh, England and rest of Europe. So it begins with this uh, very categorical statement that the history of the United States more than that of most nations has been depicted as a grand and heroic narrative, a great epic of the triumph of the human spirit over adversity. If you're familiar with the history of uh, the political history of America and how it emerged from the 13 colonies and how it carved out a distinct identity for itself in the post-war period, you would exactly know how uh, indomitable the, it becomes, uh, you know, how indomitable the human spirit was uh, as against every adversity, every historical and political adversity that the nation had faced. Uh, the victory of good over evil and the success of the individual in the face of enormous odds. And this, in a nutshell, also had paved way towards the um, formulation of the American dream. From colonial times well into the 20th century, the theater was not only a reflection of this mythology, it was a crucial instrument for the molding of public perceptions. It would not be wrong to say that uh, the plays that we have looked at and the many other plays which are part of the, the 20th century American uh, literary tradition, uh, they all uh, in some form or the other reflect, mirror what the society is thinking about. It's not essentially always in tandem with the uh, state's ideas, but it of course, you know, always uh, almost always mirrors and more importantly the public perception about uh, the certain abstract notions such as uh, uh, success, material comfort and the many idealisms which are built in and around that. Uh, so uh, here uh, in this uh, essay Arnold Aronson like many others he begins by locating American theatre as the closest thing to a national forum that the country had. So if you compare this American literary history, American cultural history with that of uh, England or so the rest of Europe, so we find that it uh, took, uh, um, they, there was nothing uh, common as a national thing to begin with when the state was formed, when the nation came into being. So uh, American theater in that sense emerges as the perhaps, you know, the first uh, formal, tangible, uh, concrete site where uh, uh, a certain homogeneity in terms of uh, a national site could be identified. Ideas were debated, public opinion was formulated, and national consciousness was achieved on the sta stages of American playhouses. Though uh, at the beginning it was already city-centric, like uh, New York was the uh, cultural capital of most of these uh, uh, plays and most of these activities, we find that the ethos that uh, got uh, reflected over there was uh, part of the national consciousness, could be identified with the national consciousness which was also emerging. So uh, it, in that sense, the popular drama, drama was uh, you know, before uh, uh, TV, television and cinema entirely took over. Uh, drama was a major form of entertainment for the longest time and it continues to stay so though in certain, in very uh, elitist ways. Uh, 
So, uh, as long as the American narrative was unfolding, the popular drama was a critical tool for the dissemination of ideas and the creation of a national sense of unity and purpose. So, we find that, uh, like most literary histories, America is also going through this phase, maybe a bit later, but in the 20th century, using uh, uh, you know, these plays, using these performances to forge a sense of national uh, consciousness and national unity a sense of purpose that they all can relate with irrespective of their uh, backgrounds and circumstances. But the World War I, as uh, we also have noticed in the plays that we have dealt with, it began to reshape the American consciousness because uh, it was, you know, until that point of time, America was not a big player, big international player uh, on the world stage. It was just um, uh, one among the many players and not even a, one of the major players. But after the World War, we find that America emerges as a central protagonist and with World War II we find that you know this notion is more or less cemented. The story of America is entirely rewritten from this stage onwards. It's a new phase that America is entering after the Second World War with the transformation of global politics and economics while permanently altering America's international position and fundamentally transforming life and sensibility in American society. And this was uh, simultaneously a positive thing as well as something you know people began to uh, dread after a point because as we noticed in the previous session the crisis that emerged in the post-war period in America was not something that came out of poverty it wasn't something that came out of a sense of lack it was a crisis which emerged out of prosperity and uh, which is why you know the insecurities and anxieties were of a very different kind than you know, compared to uh, England or the rest of Europe and it had to be addressed in a very different way altogether. So we find that in this sense uh, the uh, American theater becomes a site where this uh, a new story of America, the story of America begins to be rewritten during this new phase. So some of the questions that uh, these plays also deal with reflecting the consciousness of the nation is the question of moral purity and the motives of the United States. We all know the part that the role that America played in both the world wars and it also had um, questioned the sense of morality uh, on which the post enlightenment uh, western civilization was built. So uh, in, the, in, 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 uh, in about you know a uh, couple of decades, two to three decades after the Second World War, also during the time when the Cold War phase was emerging, we find that America was uh, uh, not so not not quite tension free because there was a rising tension of race relation uh, about the growing awareness of the class differences leading to almost you know poverty in certain segments, and the wars that America directly began to was involved in the wars, uh, the, the um, Vietnam War and the war with Korea. And there was even a discomfort with the materialism, like you know, we pointed out in the previous session. It was a crisis which emerged out of prosperity, American dream and the promise of material comfort, material wealth, the newer roads which were being carved out in order to reap this success, they always beginning to be seen as problematic. So there was a growing discomfort with the materialism of the affluent society. These were the terms, you know, just like consumerism and the uh, purchasing power. These were the new terms that during those decades, America was beginning to familiarize itself with. So all of this contributed to a reevaluation of American society and it needed new archetypes to begin with. And it needed new archetypes to begin with because the old world order was eroding in every possible way. Um, so, which is why, you know, it also makes sense for us to understand this transformation from melodrama towards realism, which was witnessed, which we began to witness from the 19th century onwards and became clearer in uh, the 20th century. So, uh, uh, there are, of course, you know, a lot of critical uh, views which uh, feel that uh, the period between the two world wars were the golden age in American theatre. But we find that in terms of capturing the essence of what America was going through, the post-war uh, theater, the post-Second uh, World War theater does immense justice as well. A lot of uh, things uh, from the past, the in-between decades of the war, where uh, uh, a lot of uh, things uh, which uh, brought about positive changes in the American uh, theater scene, uh, had been happening like the emergence of the group theater in the 1930s and the point is you know all of these contributed to the emergence of a sense of nationhood 
and an identifiably distinct American voice was beginning to emerge from the 1930s and 1940s onwards. The um, American theater, American literary tradition was no longer uh, a shadow of what was happening in Europe. And we also find that, you know, I mean, uh, we did see the timeline. We took a look at the timeline in the uh, previous uh, uh, session where we noticed that uh, America is also, you know, uh, coming to the forefront of world literature in terms of awards, in terms of international visibility, in terms of international reputation. So it is, uh, we find the post-World War period becoming a game changer in every sense of the term. It's not just political superiority. We find that there is a sense of cultural superiority too that America is beginning to uh, uh, claim. Um, so the uh, end of Second World War brought about a lot of changes in the American society. Uh, first of all, it brought unprecedented wealth and power uh, to the United States and historical precedents suggest that such hegemony might have presaged a vigorous and energetic theater as in Elizabethan England, the France of Louis XIV or 15th century Athens, but this was not to be. A certain confidence, sense of well-being and exuberance, of course, did manifest itself in American culture, but more often in consumer goods than in art because it's a different age altogether. It's a capitalist society which is emerging. So though perhaps, you know, the uh, the, the energy of the Elizabethan England or the 5th century Athens is not getting replicated, we find that a sense of superiority is beginning to grow, not just in the American minds, but it begins to be perceived, begins to be very tangibly visible for the rest of the world as well. And there are a lot of uh, you know, objects which assume um, importance at this stage. For instance, you know, cars, yeah, and uh, they were, you know, uh, began to sprout tail fins and that was seen as futuristic icons of useless excess, yeah. For instance, you know, the 1948 Cadillac, yeah, and uh, they, the homes began to uh, be filled in with gleaming white app appliances. Sleek entertainment centers disguised as furniture became the centerpieces of living rooms and movies increasingly abandoned the noir tones of black and white for the saturated colors of Technicolor. So this is in fact, you know, uh, it, uh, which is why uh, if you notice in most of these uh, plays that we have already looked at, it begins with the description of the living room. The description of the living room tells us a lot about uh, the, the objects which are part of the living room tells us a lot about the class uh, and the ideals that the family uh, embraces. Uh, so, um, there, it's John Kenneth um, um, Galbraith who popularized the term or, uh, affluent society in 1958. And we find that, you know, these terms which are part uh, as well as products of this new capitalist consumerist uh, culture, it's uh, becoming part of the national vocabulary too. So this term affluent society, it implied a general material prosperity, but it also indicated, it also in an ideal sense suggested a more democratic form of wealth than that of the earlier generations. You can compare this with the kind of wealth distribution or the lack thereof, which was there in England as well as in the, uh, in the rest of Europe. So this uh, was a whole society that, there was a whole society that was, uh, you know, was sharing in the riches. At least there was a potential to share the riches, share the wealth which was available for everyone. And it wasn't just a small set, a set of uh, uh, barons, not just a small set of uh, privileged classes. And uh, the truth was, of course, that while the general standards of living were raised significantly for most people, and the middle class had a heretofore unheard of purchasing power, yeah, there were still significant disparities within the society and disturbingly large segments of poverty. Yeah? So there is an, uh, there is an, um, an uh, initiative, and a lot of initiatives being taken towards democratizing wealth, distributing wealth, but you know, it's not without any uh, um, um, negative influence because we find that there are certain pockets which continue to operate as being more privileged than the other. And this affluence too, this uh, perceived affluence at least, that also contributed to the, uh, to, to, to the uh, no, logical uh, ending of uh, uh, the, the American melodrama that was moving on towards more and more a realist uh, tendency. So um, it's stated as, and I stated over here, uh, as American society became, became increasingly fragmented in the post-war years, it was mirrored in a fragmented theater by an increasingly introspective and highly ambiguous drama. 
This is something that we saw in a zoo story, in a glass menagerie. A lot of these inner conflicts which also become part of uh, the realist uh, depiction. Because theatre, in some sense, it continues to retain uh, the uh, relevance to a national discourse. So uh, even when, you know, uh, the, the new technologies of popular music, film, television, Hollywood, all of these things are uh, beginning to, you know, uh, eat into the theatre going audience, we find that the theatre continues to remain at that site where a national discourse could be carried out. So which is why, you know, perhaps it was uh, always seen for the longest time as a tool for localised political and social debate. We find a lot of things which are of pressing concern, not just political and social things, but, you know, which are of pressing moral concern, emotional concern are also discussed in uh, uh, these plays. So there is a post-war consciousness that we find emerging. Yeah. So uh, in fact, you know, Henry uh, Luce, uh, he wrote this in Life magazine. We know how lucky we are compared to all the rest of mankind. At least two thirds of us are just plain rich compared to all the rest of the human family. Rich in food, rich in clothes, rich in entertainment and amusement, rich in leisure, rich. Yeah. So uh, in this post-war period, America emerges very clearly as a formidable leader, emerges as the wealthiest, most powerful and most technologically advanced nation on earth. This is something that we know, you know, how it came about and the rest is history. Uh, so this also led to the emergence of a particular kind of consciousness. Yeah? So there was also discomfort with this newfound power. All was not well with it. There is a distinct identity. There is clearly a distinctive American voice emerging out of the cultural and uh, political and uh, social articulations, but there's clearly a discomfort as well. So this discomfort is a combination of this uh, dominance, this unquestionable dominance on the one hand, and a constant questioning of the moral obligations that America uh, has towards the rest of the world, yeah, and uh, in in some sense, you know, it's uh, either the rest of the world or towards the lesser advantaged within the same society, and this uh, uneasiness, this discomfort, we find, has informed the post-war art in both its form as well as in its content. This is something you know uh, we would continue to reiterate. Like, you know, this is a crisis, an anxiety, a dilemma born out of prosperity. Uh, so this also meant that when the World War, uh, Second World War ended and uh, it also ended, you know, simultaneously along with the war, what also ended was the European domination, the or European dominance in the, uh, of the art world. And we find that, you know, wherever this gap was found, you know, this, uh, the spaces vacated by the European uh, masters, the European artists, the European um, art forms, we find that, that sp those spaces were filled in with American culture. There clearly is a vacuum in most parts of Europe right after the Second World War and the American culture just in some sense, you know, in a, with a increasing vigor, it fills up all that gap. So New York City, we find New York City emerging as the cultural capital of the United States as well as the rest of the world. Yeah, And this is, uh, again, you know, a grand narrative uh, which continues to get celebrated, but there is also discomfort associated with it. Clifton um, uh, Fadiman in 1940, uh, he mentioned this in a radio discussion. Here we find him echoing uh, news. We have reached a critical point in the life of a nation. We are through as a pioneer nation. We are now ready to develop as a civilization. This is totally undercutting uh, how the Western civilization had been seeing itself for the last many, many centuries. Yeah? And he also says, the, uh, you know, one could also add Clement uh, Greenberg's observations to this. The main premises of Western art have at last migrated to the United States along with the center of gravity of production and political power. So we find America emerging as the center of world politics, as the center of world economy, and by extension, the center of world art itself. Yeah. So, um, uh, so it's at this juncture in the decades after the war, after the Second World War, we find that America is able to free itself from the subservience to European art. And a unique American voice is emerging over here. And this finds its perhaps, you know, the most critical and the purest reflection in 
in the American theater. So uh, theater also in that sense, it begins to explore new avenues of expression. And uh, uh, it uh, because, you know, there's also this uh, uh, succinct need to move away from everything that was uh, traditional so far. So there is a by 60s and 70s, there's a need to uh, emerge with something very avant-garde in uh, uh, American theater, which could also become international theater by extension. So there's also, you know, a tendency to make sure that this avant-garde did not supplant or uh, supplant the established or the traditional theater that preceded it, and which clearly meant that it was moving away from everything that was uh, making America subservient or an extension of England or the rest of Europe. Of course, uh, our theatre began to decline in some form as well because the other forms of entertainment uh, were also uh, blooming uh, almost in every part of the country. So, uh, in, 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 in this process, and it's inevitable to see these sort of decline, uh, but this decline did not mean that the space went away entirely. The space continued to remain as this uh, site where a national consciousness could be enunciated. So, we find that there is a significant transformation in the way things are being looked at as well. The world view is also changing. Politics were now determined by military alliances. Moral ambiguity gave way to fervent patriotism and entertainment function in service to the war effort. Yeah? So, we find all of these uh, uh, changes also getting inbuilt into the way our theatre continues to perform. So, 1945 is seen as a very significant year. This is uh, when, you know, the glass menagerie was staged and the arrival of Tennessee Williams is seen as an event, a milestone which sig signaled a very uh, genuine shift in American drama. So, Glass Menagerie premiered a few months before the war's end, the spring of 1945, and we find melodrama and psychotherapy being uh, experimented with, being explored extensively in Glass Menagerie, as we have already, already, uh, we have already noticed. So, uh, if we read through this, we could uh, see his plays took the binary classic American themes of home and family and using an essentially melodramatic vocabulary of a lost past, unrequited love and yearnings for a better future, explore the inner workings of a societally marginal characters. Inner working being the most, uh, the, the uh, operative term here, the, the key term here. So, Amanda and Lara, they are the focus of the play. But it isn't the character of Jim, the gentleman caller, who failed to fulfill his potential, yet who sells himself as the epitome of the American striver. Yeah? Because we know that you know, he's planning to take advantage of the newest technology, television. Yeah? So it's a very different way in which we begin to look at the play when we also are, are aware of the changing consumerist uh, uh, patterns in the economy. And Tom, the sun straining against the stifling atmosphere of the home, but with no plans other than unarticulated yearnings for excitement that Williams has created the post-war American characters. So these characters are typically post-war, the women as well as the men. Uh, though, you know, they seem to be appearing, they, uh, though they seem to be uh, inhabiting different locations emotionally, we find that they are all products of the same war. They all came out uh, through this crucible of war, but they do have distinct identities. And that's also the essence of uh, diversity, which uh, uh, American theater, uh, uh, perhaps, you know, our foregrounds over here. And Tom could be seen as a prototype of this anti-hero, the rebel without a cause. Yeah? So here we also find that as uh, uh, foregrounded over here, uh, Tennessee Williams is able to get into the inner workings of the minds and souls of these characters without reverting to the contrived and uh, self-conscious theatrical devices employed by Eugene O'Neill. That's also something that we witnessed, that we uh, saw in the play Emperor Jones. Yeah? So, Glass Menagerie is not a political play. It's not a morality play either. You know, Williams himself, you know, as we noted before, he himself had referred to this as a memory play. And this worked as a metaphor uh, for the country on the verge of something new, yet filled with doubts and insecurities and unwilling to let go of a romanticized past. We, we see this unwillingness to let go in the mother's uh, uh, character. In fact, you know, we see this unwillingness to let go of the past in uh, Lorraine Hansberry's uh, uh, characters as well, though in a slightly different way altogether. 
So, uh, in a stylistic sense, uh, Tennessee Williams drew much from the symbolist, but uh, you know we find him that uh, with the association uh, uh, with the uh, associative world of the surrealist, which he brings into play in this uh, drama, he is able to create uh, the perfect ambience for what he calls uh, uh, as a memory play. So, following the footsteps of William Saroyan, Williams created the genre of poetic realism or American symbolism, which is the closest thing U.S. had to a national style for the next fifteen years. So, what we need to what what we need to uh, underscore over here is the possibility of producing something of a national scale. Yeah, there's a national discourse which American uh, theater is. Uh, 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 you know, engaging with. There's also national style which with Glass Menagerie and with Tennessee Williams plays, you know, they, they seem to be getting closer to identifying uh, a national style which could get replicated in a number of other uh, successive plays. And, um, and here, you know, uh, it, this is a perfect mix of uh, being able to critique the society while also exploring the inner workings of the, uh, uh, of individual characters. And it's in this same vein that uh, uh, Arthur Miller is also being talked about in his Death of a Salesman, in a series of productions that typify the post-war style and that some would see as a pinnacle of American theater. So it's a, it's a stellar combination by mid uh, uh, 1940s, which is happening in the post-war period, with Tennessee Williams, Arthur Miller, all you know, writing plays and experimenting with something which would eventually become the national style itself. So, this fascination with psychology continues to remain uh, quite dominant and uh, we find that, you know, it, it also gets, uh, uh, you know, very well played out in a number of works uh, such as, you know, Williams' Streetcar uh, named Desire, which was also a stellar success and went on to uh, win a lot of awards as well. Uh, so, Arthur Miller's All My Sons too, we find it used the war as a background for the moral exploration of individual responsibility. So, this is something we had discussed at length while we were looking at the play too. Like most other plays, it was also set uh, in a home in a small midwestern community. The play was not about the war per se. It's a post-war period where war has little to do except influence the way in which people are uh, beginning to think or you know, the way in which people change their uh, world views. So, the play was not about the war per se, but about the individual's responsibility towards a larger society. Yeah? And this is something which becomes a matter of conflict as we saw within these uh, families too. So, the protagonist Joe Keller, he had manufactured faulty uh, parts of an airplane which also led to the uh, you know, death of a number of uh, uh, young pilots. Uh, so, putting profit ahead of uh, morality, he sold defective parts to the army, leading to the deaths of several flyers and ultimately the suicide of his son. And uh, though, you know, it ends with a very tragic note, it's also a commentary on this, uh, the need to relook at, you know, revisit the, uh, the, the contours of uh, morality re-look at the yardsticks of morality in this new changing economic uh, scenario. So, what uh, uh, Miller uh, does through this is, with this play, Miller established himself as a keeper of America's conscience, but it was not an investigation of war. So, it's a thin line that they are treading over here to. They're critiquing what is happening out there, but that does not become, uh, you know, a, a in, in any way, you know, they're not disowning what is happening over there, but he also establishes himself as this essay points out as a keeper of America's conscience. So, the other thing that we notice in the post world uh, war period, uh, the combined effects of the of depression, the economic depression, and the world war, it completely altered the economic and aesthetic uh, uh, structure. So, there is an artistic fragmentation and a uh, geographic decentralization which happens in American uh, theater, which also means that, you know, there is a steady decline in the number of productions and uh, uh, there, a, there are other forms of, you know, newer forms of entertainment which is taking over. There is all the movement uh, across, you know, between the rural and the urban also contribute to it. But uh, uh, nevertheless, I, uh, you know, I stated over here, theater, American theater remained as a focal point of American intellectual life and such was seen to fill a role that movies could not. Yeah? So, this is very important. There is a decline in numbers, the production costs go, um, you know, uh, go up and in some sense it also becomes something, you know, uh, a form of entertainment for the elite 
But nevertheless, we find that uh, the role played by uh, the American uh, uh, theater is that of, you know, it continues to remain as the focal point of American intellectual life. So this is something, you know, which is very, very central uh, while we are trying to locate the place that we are looking at. Yeah. So we will uh, bring this discussion to a close with this and we will continue to look at the various impacts that the post-World War uh, scene had on the different theatrical enunciations. The, uh, no, the particularly the place that we have already looked at. So with this, uh, uh, we bring this discussion to a close and uh, thank you for your time. I look forward to seeing you in the next session.